My name is Anthony Glassford Powell. The day I commit the murder, something told me don't go, something's gonna go wrong. But I still went. I still made that choice and I still went. At the time, you know, gun was a big thing, like, wow, you put a gun at someone, they used to do anything. So I just went to the pub, I just bought the gun. Later on that evening, my plan was to talk tough a bit, and then walk away. I knocked on the door, the door answered. I put the gun to his chest. I said, get back, get back. There's a struggle, and within seconds within that struggle, bang. Well, they're dead. Murder is the ultimate crime. Punishable by life in prison, or in some countries, execution. But scientists are beginning to understand how biological, psychological and social factors can combine to make someone more likely to kill. Their findings are set to change our perception of crime and punishment forever. Now, for the first time, convicted murderers submit themselves to a groundbreaking investigation as two criminal experts hunt for the causes of their crimes. Did they really have control over their actions? Or did hidden factors mean they were always destined to kill? My parents didn't grow me to kill. Could it be my genes? Could it be my blood? There are answers what I'm looking for. So this is Anthony Glassford Powell. Born in 1971, he had a tariff of 20 years for the offence of murder. I mean, the, the one thing we've got here is the coroner's report that a victim died from a shotgun wound to the chest. Professor Adrian Rain is a pioneer of neurocriminology. He spent 42 years performing tests on murderers, looking for recurring patterns that might explain their crimes. Our work on the biological basis of crime is revolutionising our knowledge of what causes violence. For example, children of mothers who drank really heavily during pregnancy, they've got a 56% rate of developing criminal behaviour. However, biological factors by themselves do not cause a man to murder. But in combination with a bad social environment, that leads you down the wrong psychological path, that's what makes a murderer. The offence took place in a flat in South London. Adrian has teamed up with forensic psychologist, Dr Vicky Thakordas Desai. There's always a story when it comes to a murder. They don't just happen randomly. She spent 20 years analysing violent offenders in Britain's toughest prisons, looking for hidden factors which may have triggered their behavior. This could be anything from educational background to trauma and abuse. The idea of putting together their experiences and how their bodies and brains are built is transforming our understanding of why people do terrible things. Over the next three weeks, they will put Anthony Powell through a raft of biological and psychological tests. I believe that when factors early on in life shape criminal and violent behavior, then that's not the individual's control. That's not their choice. Together, they will investigate whether hidden factors could have shaped Anthony's fate. What is it that you hope to achieve from this process? Well, that's to look back on my life. Where do I go wrong? You know, why did I make the choices I made? I come from a good family. I was in church one day and everything was happy. Mm -hmm. And then the final outcome was I got arrested for murder. Where did that come from? 
you know, you're very brave to come here. You know, I really respect you for your courage yeah. in opening yourself up yeah. to all of us, basically. Yeah. I'm hoping the three of us will be able to work together to build up a coherent story about what led Anthony mm. into the, that situation. Okay. I've never really looked deep into my past. There's a lot of broken pieces, a lot of things unanswered. You know, there's stuff I don't, don't really understand. I've had no family members in prison. Hopefully, you know, this would unpick some stuff. At the time of the murder in 1993, Anthony was 21. That decade, the rave scene and crack cocaine epidemic were in full swing, creating an explosion in the market for illegal drugs. As competition between rival suppliers escalated, so did the level of violence. And soon South London was awash with money and guns. Deeply entrenched in this world, Anthony claims he was asked to go to an address near Croydon to collect a £5,000 debt. That led to the fatal shooting of David Edwards. And to Anthony, serving a life sentence for his murder. When I ask an offender to recount their offence, I'm interested in whether there are any discrepancies or inconsistencies. It's also about observing their body language, how comfortable or uncomfortable they might be recalling what happened. Having read the case file, Vicky will begin her investigation by analysing Anthony's own account of his behaviour at the time of the murder. I'd like to find out from you what was life like four weeks before the offence took place. I was living an unstable life. I'd do anything to make money. My core cool belief is that to me to have a BMW, I've got a fee for it. I can't work and get it. For me to have respect, I've got to be a bad man. You've got to have a knife. You've got to make people fear you for respect. I believe that violence solves problems. That no one messes with me. I was involved in a drug culture. Gang affiliated, but solo individual. What sort of offences have you been arrested for? Assault, theft, robbery, robbery, drugs and murder. When an individual is so entrenched in criminality, they just can't see beyond that point. They're blinkered. Quite often, the behaviour escalates outside of their control very quickly. Let's move on to the day of the offence itself. Talk me through that day. I decided that I was going to go to this address to um, retrieve some money with a loaded gun. Tell me how you decided to take a gun with you. I can't go to a situation and say, uh, let me talk to you about some money or let me talk to you about something. You're going to get a gun pushed in your face or you're going to get cut or stabbed or whatever it may be. So you've got to be the most powerful. So the most powerful was to, to, have, to have a gun. OK. So what happened next? I just remember that it was dark. It could have been after six, seven o'clock or something like that. I wasn't far, 10 minutes away, 15 minutes away. Came out of car. There was loud music playing. I went up there and knocked on the door. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Door opened. I put the gun to him and said, get back in there. And then Within seconds, there's a struggle. Bang. Big bang. That's a horrible part of it. You know, it's loud and your, your ears are echoing. 
That was a smoke. Yeah, the smoke faded away. I saw it with him like, on, on, the, on the floor, holding his chest and coughing. And then they're dead. And that was it. Sorry. You know, at the time, I was, I was, I was, I was different. I was a different guy. I didn't. No thought process. I didn't really. I was self-centered. I, I didn't. I just. I need a break. I'll be alright. I'll go back in there. I'll be alright. Just. I don't know. Just bring him back to shit, that's all. That's, that's all. The way in which the offence is recounted will evolve over time. We know that Anthony denied his offence for a long time after he came into prison. And for somebody who may have been interviewing him, Anthony would have been very different to what we see today. During our interview, Anthony was very emotional. He was very distressed by the impact of his actions. To what extent did you think this was the real McCoy that you had there. I'm not saying this is true of Anthony, but psychopathic-like individuals can feign emotions. Mm -hmm. They can put on the crocodile tears. Mm. And I was really conscious of that as well. And looking at his emotional reactions, I felt that Anthony's remorse has been very genuine, but it's something that I'll watch out for in future interviews. My take for what I should be doing is to get a brain scan conducted on Anthony to see if there's any further clues which may lead us forward into understanding the homicide. Adrian's taking Anthony to one of the world's leading brain research facilities. Do you have any metal inside your pockets? No, I've got nothing at all. He's looking for neurological factors which may have influenced Anthony's violent behavior. Hello, Anthony. You're okay, right? Yeah. Great, okay then. All behavior comes from the brain. That's where MRI has really changed the landscape in our understanding of what causes crime. In any murder, one of the factors could be something going wrong with a person's brain. It can make you more angry, impulsive. It could make you lack feelings for other people. These are all risk factors for crime and violence. OK, we're going to start the first scan very shortly, OK? I've never had a chance to explore my brain or to look into myself. But I am ashamed of some of my past, so the truth. Choices I made and the things that I did. But at the time, for me, it was all right, because I didn't know myself. Knowing more about myself will change how I feel about my past, 100%. I'm sure. His brain has got a dilated temple hole. Even with the naked eye, there is evidence of possible brain damage. And that could be a marker for some type of head injury. Anything, yeah, you're right. Good job, Anthony. Yeah. We were seeing some degree of head trauma. This is essentially water called cerebrospinal fluid. And if you have some trauma or damage to a part of the brain, then the tissue is lost and you'll have more water showing. Now, if you look at this side here, you see it's significantly less. Yeah. Have you had any head injuries in your life? Yeah, I think I could have been about 16. I got hit over the head. What with, way? With a um, metal object. Were you knocked um, out? Yeah, I was, yeah. Did you ever have another head injury similar yeah, to that? The about first about a year one? after, yeah. A car lock. It's an old school lock used to lock the steering wheel. This was some sort of fight you yeah. were involved in? Yeah, all fights. The damage Adrian has uncovered, caused by Anthony's multiple head injuries, 
is the first biological risk factor for crime and violence. The brain's a very delicate mechanism and when you whack the head, it's going to get damaged. And there's no recovery from neural loss. So your behavior is going to change in a way that could make you more violent. Yeah, there was a hammer as well. So I forgot that one. Them headaches went on for about two weeks. What does that do for crime? The research in the past has shown that people with head injuries are four times more likely to become criminal and violent. I'm just amazed that you're still here and standing after all those head injuries. <laughs> There's many times I could have lost my life. You know, you don't feel vulnerable because you're tough. The more angry you are, the more, more respect you get. The more tough you are, the more respect you get. But you know, looking back, that wasn't respect, that was for you. Diamond, you want food? That's you. That's you, yeah? Sausage rolls and some yeah, stuff like much. that for you, yeah? You, so you got a drink? You want a drink as well? Yeah? All right, then I'm coming. Convicted murderer Anthony Powell was released from prison seven years ago after serving 20 years of a life sentence. I'm given an opportunity to contribute back into society, to do good in my life. But for the victim, the victim family, they ain't got that chance. You can't bring back the son, you can't bring back the father. You take a life. I mean, you can't fix it. Now, Anthony has volunteered for an investigation into the hidden factors which could have influenced his behavior and led him to kill. What we're trying to understand here is what causes crime. What factors leads a child or an adolescent to grow up to become a violent offender in order that we can prevent that happening down the road in the next generation of kids and teenagers. Professor Adrian Rain has already found damage to Anthony's brain in an MRI scan. He has now taken detailed measurements of the size of key regions and compared them to those of the average person. I've now been able to crunch the data and I'm seeing some abnormalities in Anthony's brain. I found a reduction in the volume of the hippocampus. We know that that part of the brain is involved in learning and memory. So if we plot the volume of Anthony's hippocampus and compare it to the general population, Anthony is in the bottom 10%. And that could have knock-on effects to learning and memory problems. Anthony's unusually small hippocampus is one of several anomalies Adrian has discovered. We've got here the posterior cingulate. It's a real hub in the brain. It's involved in vigilance. How much is the posterior cingulate down in volume? Well, bottom 3%. He's really rock bottom. So what does that mean for Anthony? Well, you know, this part of the brain, when there's impairments to it, that's associated with poor attention, poor ability to remain vigilant. We know that Anthony has brain impairment. But what we don't know yet is whether that impairment is a result of head injuries at around the age of 16, 17 years of life, or whether it was a result of very early brain development. Vicky wants to investigate whether the learning and attention problems Adrian identified were present during Anthony's early adolescence, and if so, how they combined with his surroundings to shape his future behavior. I'd like to go back to your education. What was the start of secondary school like? I didn't do too good at school. I was slow with reading and writing. I was always getting kicked out of the class. Sent out outside, you got to face the wall. So I was left at the back. I couldn't absorb information from the teacher. The teacher would be talking. I'd say to the guy next to me, what was all that about? I didn't understand nothing what went on. Mm. And I just couldn't keep still. I could never keep still. And did you get any support? 
From who? There was no support in school then. It was like, mm. what time did you go to bed? You must have been up late. Mm. Is there loud music in your house? So it was made to feel like it was your fault that you couldn't read or write? My fault or my parents' fault. I see many young people who have learning, memory and attention problems. Their behaviour is seen as challenging, as disruptive. Schools aren't equipped to maybe manage the intensity of some of those behaviours. What other things were you experiencing at school? This school was all boys, gangster, tough, all gladiators. Mm. You had bad boys who come back and assault teachers. I see a bad boy come back with a machete and run down a teacher. Mm. I see a teacher get knocked out. Dinner ladies and they got pushed down to the floor. Smash a till on the floor and then all you could see is hands and feet going for the money. I see these things in the first years of secondary school. It was madness. I'd like you to rewind back yeah. to the first time you broke the law. I think that's when I went shoplifting. How old were you? 11. After school, I went with a bunch of lads. I couldn't even tell you why we went to a skiing shop. Of all places we went. And um, I nicked a pair of gloves. Everyone else got away and I got caught. Were you charged for that? Yeah, theft. How did the offending escalate after that? Well, I got expelled from school. What happened? I was robbing the guys in my class. I was taking away their dinner money. Right. Just cursing off teachers. And then I think I threatened uh, the dinner lady. I think they sent me home one day never to return. How old were you? I was young. 13, I think, something like that. So I live in the house and I go on the street and have my separate friends and do what I want to do. Young people who are continuously excluded, this is something that I see regularly in my line of work. They are unfortunately rejected from the education system and many of them will go on to finding acceptance on the streets. Vicky is taking Anthony back to the streets where he spent his days following his exclusion from school. By evoking his deeper memories, she can investigate how this environment may have shaped his actions. In the 1980s, Anthony's neighborhood was infamous for race riots, street crime, and murder. Brixton is suffering from a crime wave. You had guys robbing each other, you had drug dealing, you had armed robberies. Man, everything was going on. So, where are we now? This is Summerlayton Road. This was notorious, man. At the time I was 14, I got involved in like serious criminal activity. Twelve of us running around doing madness. And everyone wanted to be the tough guy. Now, the three of us were the same age, and everyone else was older. The connection was that we couldn't read and write, we had that in common, mm -hmm. and we gave up on like, education and school, on top to the streets. What were some of your biggest influences during that time? The gangsters and the bad men from my community. For instance, this guy's known to knock someone out. I want to be able to do that guy who could knock someone out. If this was the one who was going to the bank and getting 50 grand at the bank, I wanted to be the one to do that as well. I wake up in the morning, I put my trainers on, my T-shirt, put my bulletproof vest on, and I go on the street. When people are involved in criminal behaviour and use violence on a day-to-day -day basis, then it is just a matter of time. They are like ticking time bombs. You can foresee what the end is going to look like, but unfortunately they can't things will come crashing down and the outcome will be catastrophic. Vicky has discovered that Anthony's school exclusion and street criminality may have stemmed from his learning and attention problems. Now Adrian wants to establish whether the risk factors he found in Anthony's brain are indicative of a behavioral disorder. I suspect Anthony had attention deficit hyperactive disorder as a child. Okay, Anthony, on this we've got some cognitive tests. Okay, give it a go. 
If he did do, we may still see signs of that in poorer attentional abilities. Oh, come on, man. And planning and poorer impulse control. He's pausing a lot. I think that means he's finding the task a bit difficult. ADHD was only officially recognized in the UK in the year 2000. Diagnosis includes a detailed verbal assessment. At that time, as a kid, did you make careless mistakes in your work? Very often. Right. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning that there was something going wrong early on in life with the development of the brain. Leaving your seat in situations in which you had to keep seated. Try to leave my seat, yeah, very often. Talked excessively. Always. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't lost that. Have you? If it's ignored, ADHD is a significant risk factor for crime and violence. We know that between 25 and 40% of prisoners have ADHD. Well, I have to tell you, I was very surprised. I didn't quite expect such dramatic results. It's highly likely Anthony had severe ADHD as a child. So this is a pretty strong finding. And maybe that results in the sort of chaotic life that he had on the streets. Professor Adrian Rain has devoted his life to investigating the biology of murderers. His work challenges the fundamental concept of criminal responsibility. Let's go a bit to the future, and you've got a 10-year-old boy. And I come to you and I say, you know, we've run biological, psychological, and social tests on your little Johnny. And he's got a 70% chance of growing up to become a violent criminal offender. That's the bad news. The good news is this. We've developed new intervention and prevention programs that can take little Johnny, and in two years' time, we can reshape him for the better. But there's a 70% chance that it will work. Question for you, what would you decide to do? With my kid, what would I do? I'd put him into treatment. Professor Rain is searching for biological factors that could have combined to lead Anthony Powell to becoming a murderer. You know, I've never made anyone take these tests on me. I just would have refused before, but now I understand, like, you know, these, these things need to be done. Adrian has already found evidence of anomalies in Anthony's brain and assessed that he has severe ADHD. Now he's trying to discover whether these risk factors developed at some point during Anthony's life or if he was born with them. Can you see a little black space in between the two leaflets? He's found an important clue, an imperfection from when Anthony's brain was forming. You can see it right there. Can you see a gap or space? That is called carvum septum pellucidum. Anthony has a small version of carvum septum pellucidum. We're talking about a space that's just a few millimeters. That means the brain was not developing normally very early on in life. And we are talking before six months of age. This discovery could indicate that all of Anthony's brain anomalies were present from the very start of his life. Vicky wants to examine how they may have combined with his earliest childhood experiences to shape his future behavior. What was your relationship with your family like? Close. You know, a loving mum, a caring mum. I brought up in a good household. You know, my parents are from the West Indies, you know, and you respect your parents. I went to church every single Sunday. My mum worked three jobs. My dad worked hard. My sister lived upstairs reading books. So, from what you're saying, at home, the influences were po positive. Yeah. But there was nothing nice outside my house, from my vision. 
My mum sent me to shopping. I got to walk to the shops. They're gonna go through my pockets and take away my trainers and and stuff like that. I'm not involved, mate. I want to go and shop for my mum. No one don't care if you only go and shop for your mum. Give me the money. Take your jacket off. This is how it was when I was a kid. What other things were you experiencing that was difficult? I remember when National Front and Skinheads attacked my dad. That was the first time I remember feeling kind of scared and vulnerable at a young age. Vicky is taking Anthony back to his first childhood home to trigger memories of his earliest experiences. In the 70s, in Anthony's neighborhood and across Britain, open racism was commonplace. The extreme right-wing political party, the National Front, was in its heyday and winning support in local elections. I see it written on the wall, NF on the wall, on the bus. It was a time of skinheads. Just going down the shop and you hear the N-word, shout it out, stuff like that. Vicky wants to understand how this environment may have shaped Anthony's developing personality. Yeah, so this is why I used to play as a kid. Out uh, yeah. here. I used to live at number eight. So where is your uh, Yeah, flat? the second one there, and the holes are still there where I looked at as a kid. I remember when my dad's car got stolen. Well, I was about seven years of age, and the man who stole the car, yeah, he used to yeah. live over here. Yeah, this brings back memories for me. I remember being on the balcony. So you were stood over there? And I was crying on the balcony, me and my sister. Mm. What were you crying about? My mum and dad went over there, man. Mm-hmm. And they were like, um, the National Front over there, so it was what it was. It was, it was that year and that time, that's what it was. I mean, when I was a kid around here, like, this side was like West Indian, all different type of West Indians, and over there was British. Okay. My dad went off across to confront the young man, so my dad got attacked. There was, you know, loud bangs and shouting, and he was crying up there, and then, then the police come. Remember all these sirens, the first time I see sirens. All these lights were flashing and everything. That's the first time I felt really frightened, there was confusion in my life. Yeah, that's a bit emotional still. <laughs> What did those experiences do for you? Made me angry, made me bitter. Mm. Made me say I'm going to be tougher, mm. I'm going to get bigger. So we know from research that young people who have witnessed violence are four times more likely to engage in a violent offence. But at the same time, Anthony's living in a stable, loving family environment. I would like to know what happened to disrupt that family support. Were you ever subject to any physical or emotional abuse or neglect at home? Not from my parents, no. Um, well, when I was young, I was, um, it was like, I don't know how to put it, but um, I was, I was sexually um, um, abused, sexually assaulted by an older lady. It could have been about 45 at the time. So it could have been, I think, like nine or 10. She used to take my, my bed, put me in her bed and do stuff with me as a kid and then tell me in the morning that I was sleepwalking and make excuses why I'm in her bed. But I didn't stop it. I just thought... I just kind of just went on with it. I just remember her putting me on top of her. That's what I remembered. <clears throat> It happened again, then again, then again, then it just became normal. So I'll go to bed knowing that this person's going to come for me. Did you tell anyone? 
So I sort of kind of mentioned it and I was just kind of hushed up sort of thing like, what are you saying those things for? He shouldn't say that. That's, that's how it was. Nearly one in six males have been the victims of sexual abuse in childhood and in adolescence. It can have a significant impact on development. Victims can go on to engage in risk-taking, sensation-seeking behaviours. So maybe it's not surprising then that Anthony is arrested for his first offence by the age of 11. Back in Birmingham, Adrian is now investigating whether Anthony's negative childhood experiences could have affected not just his psychology, but also his biology. What we're doing this afternoon is really looking at your physiological reactivity. Living in a stressful environment can really change biology. It'll change hormones, it'll change brain functioning, it'll change the way we feel, think and behave. Anthony is hooked up to a machine that detects microscopic changes in the amount of sweat he produces. If something makes you jump, then we'll see like a little spike on that. So you're going to see numbers appearing on the screen, counting backwards from 12, yeah. and we're going to hear a loud noise. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, your, your sweat rate went up when I... Mine did? Yeah, when I... What, just that? Yeah, just doing that. Yeah, it's very sensitive. Yeah. It's not something yeah, it did. that you would notice. Straight up. Wow. So whenever you're ready, you can press the space bar. It's a two-way street. Just as biology can affect social behaviour, the social environment can affect biology. It's exactly the same for a child growing up in a bad neighbourhood as it is for a soldier in a stressful combat situation. Let's have a look at Anthony's data here. This is a countdown occurring. He should be a little bit edgy about that blast of white noise. He should sweat a little bit more. What happens? Does he show a skin conductance response? No, nothing is going on. The data shows that Anthony's body did react to the random bursts of white noise, but did not react when he knew the noise was coming. So the message from that is Anthony is lacking anticipatory fear, being anxious, before something threatening and aversive is about to come. That's a major risk factor for criminal antisocial behavior because if you are not concerned about punishment, you ain't concerned about being caught, arrested and convicted. And that was really evident from the history that we've taken in relation to Anthony's early criminal lifestyle and offending. Putting all of this together, I think these pieces fit into one common concept a sustained lack of fear. So I think that's one important risk factor that could have predisposed, in part, Anthony to committing murder. What I want to do now, Anthony, is uh, get a saliva sample. We can get measures of important hormones. In 1993, Anthony Powell shot and killed a man and served 20 years in prison for murder. Professor Adrian Rain and Dr. Vicky Thakordis Desai have spent three weeks investigating his brain, body, and early life experiences. Yeah, so lack of planning. Lack of planning. They've found a number of hidden risk factors for crime and violence, from the trauma of child abuse to a brain predisposed to poor memory and learning. This here would probably give my mum some answers too. She beats herself up a lot, and she's done the best she can. Because there's a lot of times that I would say, Mum, why did I do that, or Dad, why was I acting like that? They really ain't got no answers for me. I'm a mystery to them. Now they're going to show Anthony a timeline of the factors they've discovered, and how they may have predisposed him to crime and violence. So let's uh, start with birth here. For whatever reason, your brain never developed normally. In particular, there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus that's very involved in learning and memory. And that was smaller in volume than what you'd normally expect. That's going to shrink your learning at school. This brain maldevelopment 
may also have caused Anthony to have severe symptoms of a behavioural disorder. It's highly likely that you had ADHD as a child. That led to challenging and unruly behaviour in school. You know, that was affecting your own self-worth. It was affecting your own sense of who you were. These risk factors then combined with multiple negative experiences in Anthony's home environment. Your estate was a rough area. There were muggings, there were yeah. robberies, yeah. and racial divide as well. One of the things you also described was the sexual abuse that took place when yeah. you were around about 10. Adrian believes these experiences blunted how Anthony's body reacts to stress and fear. If you lack that stress response, yeah. then maybe you'll get up to a lot of trouble, which is stressful for the average person. Wow. I'm wondering whether that was one of the reasons that got you into crime and violence to begin with. In adolescence, these risk factors may have combined with a surge in hormones to influence Anthony's aggressive behaviour. I took a saliva sample for measuring testosterone levels. This is a sort of average group of testosterone. And this is you. We get sort of really right through the roof there. Research has shown there's a link between high testosterone, yeah. dominance, and potentially aggression. During such a critical time, you were excluded from school. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It just pushed you in the direction of the streets. Yes. You describe being totally immersed in criminal behavior. At this time, Anthony received several head injuries, which further increased his risk of committing violence. There were drug deals going on. You were using weapons, didn't care about anyone else, and violence was a means to resolve issues. With Anthony's major risk factors laid out, Adrian and Vicky can now reveal their theory of how those factors combined to shape his behavior on the night of the murder and whether Anthony was destined to kill. That night, it really was a bit of an impulse, wasn't it? When you thought, I'm going to get that money. It wasn't exactly planned out, was it? And on cognitive tasks, we found out that you were pretty poor on the ability to make good decisions, to plan your actions. Now that was linking in with the ADHD. Yeah. So when you took the gun, well, maybe it wasn't such a good decision. And you've got that high testosterone level which drives aggression. You were ready and you wanted to get the money back using a weapon. Yeah. And this low fear response yeah. as well, that took you all the way to the victim's door. Many of us would be a bit too scared maybe to make that confrontation. Mm. You were not. You weren't frightened about the consequences of your actions. He opened the door, you stuck the gun in him, you wanted to push him back in there. You wrestled with him, you fired, and you killed him. <laughs> yeah. People say, but why and how? But now look, look at all this. Mm. This is why and this is how. I want to ask you a question yeah. on that. You've always said to me, but I made the decision. But for me, Anthony, there can be factors early on in a person's life that constrain freedom of will. And for some kids, the dice are loaded early in life, and I think you were one of those kids. I'm not making excuses, man. I behaved in all I did. I committed that serious crime, but these are true factors. Cause I know my feelings, how I felt and what I went through, and this is spot on. And there's a lot of young men out there in this situation now, but they're doing the life sentence now, mm -hmm. or on the way to getting a life sentence, has been through this here. He's going through this right now. Anthony's murder was a culmination of a load of different risk factors. His education, his learning needs, his experience of sexual abuse, 
And if any of those had been dealt with early on, then I do believe that the murder could have been prevented. Nobody's born bad. There's no destiny to crime and violence or, or murder. But are there factors very early on in life that can predispose or raise the odds that somebody will become violent? Absolutely. So I think the question is, why don't we do more to help those kids in greatest needs to get them off that criminal path in life. This process has made me look deep into myself and where I'm coming from. But again, I don't blame no one. I don't blame the school teachers. I don't blame the gangs. I take full responsibility for my actions. I'm very remorseful. Yes, I'm very sorry, very sorry. But where do we go forward from here? How do we stop? the other younger Anthony out there before this happens, what do we do? Are we going to wait and say he's bad and kick him out of school, put him in a pro school, from a pro school to prison, and then, and then start talking about it? What are we going to do? Oh,